All right. I was thinking to myself before I got up here, I was like, I'm thinking some of you could fall asleep. I wouldn't be able to tell. Got a mask on. I'm like, hmm. Okay. Well, thank goodness. No, no. All right. We're going to be in the book of Exodus this morning. Exodus 19. Exodus 19 is where we're going to be this morning. So if you have your Bibles or your Bible app, if you can join me there. But Exodus 19 is where we're going to be. Now, one thing I'm curious about, have have any of you, and, and I love our dessert auctions, but I don't know that it counts in what I'm thinking of, been to like a real live auction? Has anybody been to a live auction? Okay. One of the things I am amazed with is an auctioneer and just how fast they can speak. And give me one of them, you know, you're like, what? And they can identify all the people and they're just going and making sure they recognize the bidders and all that. And that's just amazing to me. One of the things I think I find even more amazing is what people are willing to spend on different items. Things that I'm like, really? Um, let me give you an example. Um, if you don't know who Justin Timberlake is, he is a famous singer. He started in NSYNC in the 90s. was actually on the Disney Channel before that. But anyway, someone bought at an auction his leftover French toast. He, I don't know where he ate it. But his leftover French toast for over $3,100. Leftover French toast. I don't know if they ate it or not. I don't know. Um, I'm, but anyway, like how somebody got a hold of that, how would you prove that? Hey, this is his toast? You know, but anyway, um, a clump of Elvis's hair, 15000 okay, Elvis's hair. Now, maybe if you're like me, you might want hair, but, you know. Um, but anyway, okay. Um, If you remember the Price is Right, Bob Barker, okay, his microphone, $21,000, $21,000, And then Michael Jordan, a pair of his Air Jordans that he wore, $560,000. So I don't know about you all, that's just hard to fathom. All that just seems crazy to me, Uh, especially since one, I don't have that kind of money, but to spend that money. But I think what it, it shows us is it's not really about the item. It's about who owned the item, who it belonged to, the person. And I think what's interesting for us, for those who claim to follow Jesus, what makes us have value is not us, but who we belong to. It's who we belong to. And see, what Peter's been talking about and we've been talking about this month in 1 Peter 2, is that the church is a holy nation. And that value that the church has comes from who we belong to. But what Peter's also saying is, as a holy nation, you've got to step up and be that holy nation. It's not enough for you to be called that. You have to act like it. And so that's what we're going to take a look at this morning. But we're going to come at this from Exodus. So if you have your Bibles, let's stand. And we're going to read Exodus 19, beginning in verse 1. Exodus 19, beginning in verse 1. Exactly two months after the Israelites left Egypt, they arrived in the wilderness of Sinai. After breaking camp at Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and set up camp there at the base of Mount Sinai. Then Moses climbed the mountaintop to appear before God. The Lord God called to him from the mountain and said, Give these instructions to the family of Jacob. Announce it to the descendants of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure. From among all the peoples on earth, for all the earth belongs to me. And you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Because these are the words of life. Lord, and they bring life to our very souls. And so, Father, I just ask this morning that you would speak to us. You would challenge us. 
challenge us in how we see ourselves, challenge us in how we see you, challenge us in how we see the world. And that you've put us here. You've called us to yourself. And you have a purpose for us. And so I just pray that you would speak. Holy Spirit, be the speaker. Be the mover in our hearts. Be the mirror that shows us who we are. And do what only you can do. I thank you, Father, for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now, 1 Peter 2 has been our focus, but I want to give you a little bit of background, and it'll make sense in a moment why we read Exodus 19. But in the beginning of Exodus 19, we've got the Israelites who have been freed from Egypt. The Exodus has already occurred, and that first verse tells us they're just a couple months in. They're a couple months into what's been going on. They're traveling now, and we find in later parts of Exodus that God even took them a unique way. God does unique things. Things we don't always understand, but God is always purposeful in what he does. But as he's interacting with Israel, and he's about to lay out some things, and this communication is with Moses, because Moses was the leader of the Israelites. But one of the things about this nation that God has chosen, that we have to keep remembering, and it applies to us as well, they weren't chosen because of who they were. And in Deuteronomy, we find some verses that help us see this and remember this. In Deuteronomy 7, verses 7 and 8, it says, The Lord God did not set his heart on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other nations. For you were the smallest of all nations. Rather, it was simply that the Lord loves you. And he was keeping the oath he had sworn to your ancestors. See, again right there, God is trying to show that the value comes in being chosen. The value comes in who you belong to. But he's also trying to help understand there's nothing for you to puff up about. Nothing for you to get excited. We're all that. And of course, God chose us. No, he's saying you are the smallest in nations. See, when we pick things, we look for the best or we look for the tallest or the prettiest or the smartest or the wealthiest. That's what we look for. And I think God very intentionally goes, yeah, I'm going to pick the one nobody else would. Because I'm going to show the world what I can do. I'm going to show the world what I can do. And so in this time, what's about to happen is God's about to define this relationship. This is what it looks like to be my people. This is what it looks like to follow me. If you follow me, I will be your God. I will move and I will take care of you. And so this is actually what Peter quotes. Exodus 19. This is what Peter quotes in verse 9 of chapter 2. He says, but you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. So Peter's now looking back at the Old Testament and talking to a group of people that is mixed now. This isn't just Israelites. This isn't just Jews. We've got Gentiles in this church. But now I'm saying you're all chosen. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. And now he adds a holy nation. And part of the transition he's making is from who you are to how you act. See, our identity is absolutely important. And that's something we often struggle with is where we find it and where we pull it from, whether it's our work, our relationships, our wealth, whatever it may be, our race, any of those things. And God's trying to say, I've got your identity settled. I'm the one who really knows who you are and what I've got for you. And so in order to be God's unique possession, his special people, this holy nation, what we find is there are some certain things we need to understand. And so if you're a note taker, I want to give you two things this morning. Two things this morning. The first thing is this, to be a holy nation. Holiness shows a different way. Holiness shows a different way. See, that word holy, holy means to be set apart. Set apart to be different. But see, one of the things about God is holiness is not just the way God acts. Holiness is who God is. It is his character. It is his quality. It is everything about him. And so that's one of the things that is unique to God. There are things about us in the way we act. I may act loving, and I hope I do at different times. Well, I'd like to say all the time, but that'd be a lie, so I won't say that. But see, it's one thing to describe the way I act. It's another thing to describe my character. And really, the fact is the bent of our heart is not to be loving. It is to be selfish. 
And that is part of the distinction between us and God is God is holy in himself. He always acts holy. He is different. He is other. He is set apart. And so what this is calling us is to be holy. But see, the only way we know of God's holiness is one through his word. But see, God didn't just give us words. What he actually gave was a life. And that life is Jesus. Jesus in the flesh is the one who showed us what holiness is like. Showed us what holiness is like. He brings that otherness, he brings that difference into the world, in the flesh, showing it to us. So we have an example and we have a model. And in Jesus, we have an opportunity to be holy. And this is what Paul was writing to the Corinthians about in Corinthians 1 verse 30. It says, God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. He freed us from sin. See, this is what happens through Jesus. And God wanted to show us what holiness looks like. But see, the only way we have an opportunity to be holy is through Jesus. And that comes through a personal relationship with him. See, there's a lot of people, and you can watch TV, you can watch actors, movies, politicians, whatever it may be, anybody who's well-known, And we know of them, but we don't know them personally. And that's the thing when it comes to Jesus. You need to know Jesus personally. If you want an opportunity at living a holy life, at understanding a life of purpose, and not being bound by sin, what has to happen is a relationship with Jesus. See, the question is, do you want to live your way or do you want to live God's way? How do you want to live? Because, see, sin rules. Sin rules us. And if we live according to the flesh, if we live according to sin, that's what's going to come out. And what God gave us in Jesus is a model and a person and the way to a holy life. The way to a holy life. But the question is, will you and I choose that? Will we choose that? Well, we say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you and I'm going to follow your way, not mine. You see, Jesus' way was different. Jesus lived a different life. Jesus stopped and talked to people nobody else would. Think about the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. He stops and he talks to her, has a conversation. Zacchaeus, he stops and sees him up in a tree and stops and calls him down. Everyone else, who cares about Zacchaeus? Tax collectors, fishermen, anyone else. Jesus stops and engages them. Shows love and compassion to them. And see, this is the difference. This is what holiness does in the life of a person who's been changed by Jesus is we live differently. The question becomes, are we going to fight and struggle and call out different things? Or are we going to love and care for people? Where are we going to put the priority? Is it going to be on living the way Jesus lived? Or are we going to stand up for what we think is the most important thing, which honestly sometimes may not be Jesus? We've got to choose. See, one of the dangerous things about being a holy nation is to isolate ourselves. See, that word nation really means a people, really means a group. We are a holy people. For those who know Jesus and are loved by him and called sons and daughters, we are a holy people. But the danger is we can choose to isolate ourselves. And if you look at history, that was very evident in World War II. Coming out of World War I and all that happened in that war and seeing what was caused by that and still the economics that were going on in our country, people did not want to get into World War II. Hey, that's in Europe. That's on the other side of the ocean. We're not going there. And we know from history until Pearl Harbor, we didn't fully engage in the war. But see, one of the things that we have to realize as the church is we can look at the world and go, oh, that's out there. That's not going to affect us. Folks, the fact is, culture continues to creep in here. When we look at all the issues and things that happen in our world, they're happening in the church. Issues related to marriage, related to money, they're happening in the church. It's not just going on out there. 
And so if we think we're going to be able to live isolated, we're fooling ourselves. But you know what? We weren't called to do that anyway. We're called to be a different people, a set-apart people, but we are called to engage. We are called to get out there and be a part of what's going on. We've got to engage with the world. Because, see, we can't show a difference to the world unless we interact with the world. They're not going to see it from in here. We've got to go out there. But see, when we do that, when we get out there, when we go and interact, what's going to happen is us living as a holy people, showing that difference to the world. You know what that leads to is that leads to hope. And that's the second thing for this morning. Holiness leads to hope. We're going to show the world what hope looks like. But see, understanding hope, hope is not just wishful thinking. Man, I wish that would happen. Have you ever heard the old phrase? I know some people growing up, you know, wish in one hand, spit in the other. See which gets full faster. We're not talking about wishful thinking. Biblical hope is not just a desire that something's going to happen. It's expected to happen. Because we've got a God who does what he says. And that's what he said in Deuteronomy. Why did I choose this people? Well, I made a promise to your ancestors that I was going to do this. And when I say something, I do it. And see, that's a beautiful thing and why I love Hebrews 10, 23. Love this verse. says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. Why do we hold on to this hope? For God can be trusted to keep his promise. God can be trusted to keep his promise. That's why we hold on tightly. But see, that's one of the things is this hope is not found within us. This is not a hope that we can just manufacture. Because the holiness doesn't come from us. Where does it come from? It comes from Jesus. It comes from Jesus. And it resides in him. And part of it is when our focus is on Jesus, what we recognize, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. The Bible says we're strangers, we're aliens, we're foreigners. This is temporary. Eternity is forever. So part of what needs to happen is I don't necessarily have to get caught up in everything that the world is dealing with. That doesn't mean I ignore it, but it doesn't stress me out. It doesn't worry me the same because I know it's all temporary. There's more to come. And that's where the hope comes from as a holy nation, because we go out into the world and we show that to people. We show them a peace that passes all understanding. When I say, how can you be calm in all this going on? Well, let me tell you about Jesus. There's a bigger story going on here. Does everything that's happening in the world matter? Yes. Do we have to deal with the issues of today? Yes, because someone in front of us, if they're hurting, we've got to deal with the hurt. What did Jesus say when he talked about going out in the world? He says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Those who are hungry, feed them. Those who are naked, clothe them. To walk up to someone who's hungry and say, hey, let me talk to you about Jesus. Most people say, I don't really care about Jesus right now. I'm hungry. Is Jesus going to give me some food? What I think Jesus is saying, no, is I put you right there, right in front of him for you to do it. But that's being a holy people. That's stepping up and helping people see there's hope. Now, we see someone in need. We don't walk by. We engage them. And this is how we show the world hope. This is how we show the world hope. And see, we're not... I don't believe in any sense it's pie in the sky. It's thinking we're going to solve all the world's problems because we're not going to. Jesus is the only one who can do that, but we don't ignore problems. We don't act like things aren't happening. And see, the fact is, I think especially for our young people, especially for our kids, our teenagers, they want to talk about the issues. They want to talk about what's going on. And if we don't help educate them and get in on those conversations, guess what? They're going to get it from somebody else who doesn't have a biblical perspective. But we don't want to engage in a conversation because it makes us feel uncomfortable. Well, any of you who got kids, if you've ever had the birds and bees conversation, it's not real comfortable. I don't think any parent goes, oh, I'm looking forward to that one. No. But you know what? We do it because it's loving. We do it because we need to. We do it because we want our kids to understand this world, especially from Jesus' point of view. 
And what holiness gives us is a frame. It gives us a lens to look at this world and go, okay, this world's a mess, but you know what? That's what sin causes. But God, you've saved us. We're going out into it, and we're going to see you do some awesome things. We've got to do that. This is our time to step up. And see, I think as, I, as long as I've been alive, it's something about it's always the next generation's got to do it. No. Those of us who are alive today got to do it. We got to listen to each other. We got to hear what's going on. But we know in the end, Jesus is going to make all things right. And so Jesus, until that day, here we go. We're going to step up. We're going to be your people. We're going to be a holy nation because that's what our world is hungry for. They want to see something different. They want to see something that's going to give them hope, give them peace. But will it be evident? Will it be visible in what we do? See, I like the story of a famous, I think he was a French painter, and I'm going to read his name so I don't abuse it. I think it's Paul Gustavo I don't know if it's Dor or Dore. I don't know. But he did some famous paintings, especially related to Dante's Inferno, and if you know that story or not. But as he was traveling through the countryside, he didn't have his papers. Didn't have his passport, didn't have anything to cross borders. And so he got to the border. They wouldn't let him cross. And he's like, hey, I'm this famous guy. And they're like, yeah, right. And so what did the the border agent do? He gave him paper and a pencil. They said, all right, prove it. I want you to draw those peasants over there. And so he just started drawing. And after a little bit, that border agent looked at him and goes, oh, you are this guy. And he let him cross. But see, he was known for his work. He was known for what he did. And see, my question to us is, is the church known for being a holy nation, being a holy people? Are we known for being a chosen generation? Are we known for being royal priests? Or are we known for, oh, those are the people that are against that. What are we known for? And see, honestly, I don't think we're known for all the things we want to be known for. But it's time for us to step up and show the world a difference. Show the world what a holy people looks like. It's our time. Will we do it? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. Lord, as David confronted the giant Goliath. He said, the battle belongs to the Lord. For there's, Lord, there is a battle going on today. And Lord, we look at our world and people are hurting. People are hurting financially, Lord, as we're coming out of complete lockdown and people are trying to get back to work and businesses are closing. People are hurting financially. Lord, people are hurting emotionally. Especially the strain of not getting out and being alone. Lord, we can look across our world and people are hurting racially. And God, all of it Sin brings destruction. There's no other outcome. But Jesus, you have defeated sin. As Paul said in Galatians 6, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Father, may we live in that freedom. May we be those of us who claim the name of Jesus, be that holy people that go out. Not because we've got all the answers, but we've got the one who has the answers. Love our neighbors. Listen twice as often as we talk. Well, God, may we do something. Our world is hurting, Father. Church is your plan A. There is no plan B. And so, Father, please stir in our hearts for those of us who know you. That we would take action, that we would step up. And Jesus, I pray, anyone listening, anyone who who is hurting right now, and they don't know you, 
Jesus, today would be the day where they'd say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I want you to lead my life. I want you to be the one who shows me a better way. I pray that today would be that day where they would surrender to you. And Jesus, I pray for anyone who is maybe holding back. Maybe there's a way that they need to address something. Maybe there's a way that they need to talk to a neighbor. They need to to go out and listen. Maybe it's an apology to someone. Whatever it is that we can get right with our neighbors and our friends, our community, Father. If we've offended, if we've done wrong, that we make it right. And Lord, that the people would see of this community, what's going on? And the best answer, Jesus, is going on. And so, Father, I just pray that you move in us, stir in us to be your holy people. I thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Obviously, in this time and where we are, we're not going to have our, our typical invitation. But I pray that you continue to, to think through things. Whatever the Holy Spirit is stirring in you, that you have some conversations. I'm thankful in my own home we've had, had a lot of conversations about a lot of things going on in the church, outside of the church. And I'll be honest, I'm short on answers. But you know what I think right now? If we just follow God's word, love our neighbors, be quick to listen, slow to speak, God will show us. But we've got to be willing to engage. And so I pray whatever God is doing that you will follow that. And if you've made any type of decision, we do have a decision card online, cbcmodesto.org slash decision, because we want to follow up with you. We want to help you, encourage you to walk with Jesus. We need each other. Walking with Jesus is not easy. Because there's times I want to walk my own way, not Jesus' way. But Jesus' way is always best. And so if we can pray for you as well, again, we mentioned that. We want to continue to pray. We need each other. And so I pray that as we conclude our service today, that we will keep our eyes on Jesus. He's the beginning and the end. There isn't anything else we need. And so as we close today, we're going to sing. We're going to sing, Lord, I lift your name on high. And as I mentioned, we have some ushers who will um, excuse you as we sing. So we want to make sure we don't have, have a bottleneck. And we just ask if you make your way outside, continue to share with one another, but out in the air in the open space. But I thank you for being here today. And for those who are joining us online, praise God. However we can get together, we will do it. But I pray that outside these doors, we continue to step up and be God's holy people. So let's stand and let's sing. Lord, I lift your name on high.